Vibia Perpetua was a late second, early third century noblewoman and martyr from Carthage, North Africa. At 22 years old, she was arrested along with several new Christian converts awaiting baptism, one of them being her young pregnant maidservant, Felicity. Their martyrdom is significant because much of the account appears in part written by Perpetua herself and gives us a glimpse into the oft omitted role of women in the early church. Christianity's egalitarian tendencies were particularly attractive to marginalized groups, including women. Many of the most influential Christians were greatly shaped by women in their lives of whom we know very little. It is generally acknowledged that women of nobility had a unique role in the spread of Christianity. When Christians weren't allowed to own churches, women could offer their houses to gather. While men almost exclusively held political and church offices, women could still exert significant social influence within their circles. The same gender stereotype that excluded them from leadership also portrayed women as more spiritually attuned. So, for example, while Pontius Pilate ultimately ruled on Christ's fate, his wife's dream had the potential to influence his judicial decision. Historicity aside, this story demonstrates that this sort of influence made sense to its audience. What the martyrs were arrested for and charged with is not entirely clear. Some scholars believe they were singled out because as catechumens, they were relatively recent converts and local leaders were trying to discourage conversion. The text's emphasis on the action and authority of the Holy Spirit, as well as the hostility to their community, has led some scholars to speculate that Perpetua's Christian community may have been Montanist, Montanism having attracted previous persecution for its dramatic public displays. The account has three divisions. The first is that of Perpetua and is a record of her arrest and visions to give encouragement to other Christians. The next is that of Saturus, their teacher who turned himself in upon hearing that his students had been arrested. And finally, a gruesome witness account of their actual martyrdom. All of these sections have introductions and transitions written by a redactor who may also be the martyrdom witness. For our sake, we will primarily focus on Perpetua's account and draw upon Thomas J. Heffernan's commentary for context. The account contains several visions while in jail, broken up by a narrative in which her father pleads with her to just make an offering to the Roman gods and to think of her family and her baby. In Perpetua's first vision, she steps on the head of a serpent to climb a ladder covered in weapons to heaven, representing both physical trial and spiritual ascent. As Heffernan notes, Her dream has obvious literary antecedents. It is a conflation of Jacob's ladder, Jesus' remarks on the difficulty of attaining the path to eternal life, the dragon of revelation, and the prophecy in Genesis that the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. The next day, Perpetua is condemned by the procurator, and her breasts miraculously stop producing milk as her baby was no longer her responsibility. That night, she has a vision of her young brother who died at a young age. He is still deformed from his illness and trapped in an intermediate state, desperately trying to quench his thirst. She knows she is to pray for him and does. She then has another vision of him healed and he is able to drink. Her third vision, like her first one, is that of her facing an Egyptian warrior in the arena. Heffernan's commentary highlights that. Her unnamed Egyptian opponent is simultaneously an Egyptian wrestler and an unnatural being, a devil. The foul-looking Egyptian is the physical embodiment of evil, that is, Satan. And the contest represents the struggle of the Christian soldier against Satan and his assistants. As she entered the arena to fight the Egyptian, she is stripped and turns into a man. According to Heffernan, this transformation exhibits her social understanding that the role of the martyr requires a transformation from the traditional depiction of females as non-aggressive and domestic to one of male combativeness. We see that combativeness in her vision. We approached each other and used our fists. My adversary tried to catch hold of my feet, but I kept striking his face with my heels. I was then lifted up into the air and began to strike him in a way that no earthly being could. She then triumphs over the opponent and enters the gates of life. Perpetua's section is written well, so well that Perpetua's authorship has been called into question. Perpetua's references to the classics and scripture from memory indicate a rare level of education for women in her day, even among highborn women. This could be because Perpetua was her father's favorite child. Her education is one of the many ways in which Perpetua transgressed social expectations placed on her as a mother, daughter, and a woman more generally. She also possessed spiritual authority, prioritized martyrdom over maternal obligations, and refused to submit to either her father or the procurator. This is also present in the final account of their martyrdom, wherein Felicity providentially gives birth to her child early, allowing her to be martyred with her friends. Pregnant women were not allowed to be martyred. 
the two women are forced to fight a cow, a symbol of maternity, as a mockery. Heffernan summarizes it thusly. The women, like the savage cow, are being referred to as beasts, unnatural and a disgrace to their gender. But their transgression of these roles is not freedom for freedom's sake, but a Christian understanding of freedom in Christ and a transformation of loyalties from family and empire to church and God. So while previously Perpetua's child drank from her breasts, now her prayers give drink to a suffering soul. There is a strength in conviction in the young women, and Perpetua even helps to guide the gladiator who slays them to do it proper. While their strength manifests as refusal to submit to the ways of the world, it ultimately derives from a submission to the providential will of God. The gladiator and empire are not taking her life, but she and God are allowing it to be taken. This has been Emily von Hossen for Saints and Stuff. Feel free to like and subscribe and leave a comment below if you have any suggestions for future videos.